You know, I hate the term customer experience. Everybody talks about customer experience. It's one of these things that means pretty much nothing. But you know what term I do like? I like the idea of making customers happy because it's obvious, it's clear what it is. And so today on episode number 321 of CXO Talk, we're speaking with somebody who dedicates his life to customer happiness. I'm Michael Krigsman. I'm an industry analyst and the host of CXO Talk. Now, before we go any further, please, please subscribe on YouTube. Do that now. I'm just delighted to welcome Eric Yuan, who is the founder and the CEO of Zoom Communications to CXO Talk. Zoom is a product that we actually use here, so we, we, we use it every day. Eric, welcome to CXO Talk. Thank you for, for being here. Michael, thank you for having me. Thank you. So, Eric, please tell us about, tell us about Zoom. As Zoom is a modern enterprise video communication company. We're working very hard to make a video communication frictionless. So Eric, I know, so you, you were at um, another company and you, you left to, to start Zoom. Why did, you, why did you decide to start this company, Zoom? Yeah, so yeah, it's a good question. A little bit of background about how I started Zoom. So I prior to founding Zoom, I was at Cisco and I was uh, Cisco's corporate vice president of engineering in charge of its collaboration software development. And I came to Cisco as a part of the WebEx acquisition. Actually, I built WebEx before as one of the first several founding engineers, ultimately. I became vice president of engineering. So before I left the Cisco, before I left the Cisco WebEx, so every time when I talked with a WebEx customer, I did not see a single happy customer. I personally, I felt very embarrassed. I really wanted to fix that problem. You know, Cisco is a great company, but Cisco was unwilling to change its collaboration strategy back then. That's why I had to leave to build a better solution to bring happiness back to web as customers. Eric, when you, when you talk about happiness, this is kind of a silly question because we all know what the term happiness means in, in kind of a conventional way. But what does ha customer happiness actually mean for you more precisely? So that's the most important thing, you know, to me, I think every day as a CEO to manage a company, I have so many things to work on, but ultimately I got to understand what's the number one important thing as a business, right? If we cannot make a customer happy, nothing will matter. That's why this is our number one priority. If a customer happy, everything else will be easier. And uh, you know, customers would like to talk with us, share our uh, story with, with others, and essentially, you know, will help us to further improve our product experience and also make our business better. So customer happiness then starts from really understanding the thing that's most important to them. Is that, is that the key issue here? Absolutely. you got to look at everything from a customer perspective. If you truly care about them. You are not going to look at it from your perspective. When you build a product, you will say, hey, will this product, will this feature, deliver happiness or add value to a customer or not. So anything you do, look at it from a customer perspective, then actually, you know, customer, they will part, more like a part of your business to help you to grow your business. But Eric, everybody, you know, you talk to anybody that sells a product or sells a service, everybody says the same thing. Everybody says, we talk to our customers, we listen, and yet there's a lot of unhappy customers out there. So, so drill into it. What, what are you actually talking about? So ultimately, there are three things, right? When we talk about happiness, you know, first of all, you know, your product got to work, right? Every time when customers are using Zoom, they really like it, right? That's the number one thing. Your product got to work. And every time after the meeting is, is over, customers say, yes, this experience is great. They enjoy using your product. The second thing about the process, you know, when you do business with customers, you've got to make sure your, your process is very simple, right? very easy. 
And the third thing is about the people. So meaning because uh, not only do those customers use your product, but also we want to make sure every interaction between Zoom employees and customers, say like a support, customer success manager, or our engineers, or our product managers, every interaction between our company and the customers, they enjoy, right? I think in process, in people, and the product, you know, from all those three aspects, we make sure customer happy. When you started Zoom and it, it's it's clear that customer happiness was was kind of a mandate for you at the outset. But did you think it through analytically as you just described that we need to do these three things in order to accomplish that customer happiness goal? I think, yes. Well, that's a great question. So maybe a little bit of personal story. So, you know, before I left the Cisco WebEx, right, you know, because customer not happy. So every day I was not happy at all, right? So, and after I left, and when I started a company, the first of the question I asked about it to myself was that, hey, this is a startup company, long journey. Could it be 10 years or 20 years? What kind of a company do I want to work for for the next 10 or 20 years? Ultimately, I really want to make sure every morning when I wake up, I feel very happy. I want to come to office to work, right? That's really important. Also, I understand one thing is that sustainable happiness is coming from making others happy. We apply that theory to our business. So as a business, we do all we can, right? Look at everything from a customer perspective, make a customer happy, then our business will be happy, then employee will be happy, then I'll be happy. So uh, how do we make sure customer happy? We look at every interaction, the product, the people, and the process. You know, even on day one, we already understand that. How much of your corporate effort and your personal time is devoted to this? 100% or maybe 200%. So every day, look at my calendar, right? Is a meetings with customer or look at our internal process and how to simplify that, how make sure we, we design our company process. And also from an end user perspective, do not look at it from our employee perspective, do not look at it from our internal you know, the perspective, right? So, and also the, the product as well. Right, so every day just just look at all those three things: people, product, and process. And I spend all the time on those three things. Okay, so but I need to be skeptical here, okay? <laughs> <laughs> because I'm not. <laughs> <laughs> all right, so you're an en- you're an engineer, and I know you spend a lot of time with the product. But how much? You know, when you're when you're sort of deep in the weeds of the product and figuring process and also then figuring processes out, you're not you're not always thinking or maybe you are. Uh, well, w- will this make customers happy? I mean, I guess I'm not being clear. So let me so to, to clarify, to what extent is that reference point present? And in a practical way, how do you ensure that the decisions you make Big ones and tiny decisions reflect that reference point. How do you do that in a practical way? So that's a great question. I do not think, you know, f- you know, for me, actually, I understand that. But how to, because we have uh, over 1,000 employees, right? How can we make sure everybody, when you work on something, either product or process, we always look at it from end user customer perspective. Ultimately, it boils down to our company culture. But right? everybody, we need to understand that. I'll give you one example. Like I see, like a free users, you know, they want to call our support. I just want to get some questions, you know, or try to, you know, uh, get some help. If we really focus on customer happiness, we will help them. You know, that's why what we did, right, over the past several years, we still serve our free users very well. I see the customer, they want, want to cancel. We make it a cancellation very easy, right? They do not need to, you know, spend too much time to call us to do this and then cancel the service. We make everything easier. So any decision we are going to make it here, we always want to make sure, will this help our customer or not? Will this change benefit our customer or not? So ultimately, this is part of our company culture. You know, I will say that, uh, you know, people should know that, that we're a paid user of Zoom. I mean, you guys have supported CXO Talk, uh, an underwritten CXO Talk, which we appreciate, but we're a paid customer 
of Zoom. And recently I had to subscribe to uh, the Zoom meeting connector because we had a, a guest that was using uh, you know, another, another system and they have to integrate. And, and I will say that the cancellation process was really simple. And I thanked in that moment, <laughs> I, I said a mental thank you uh, to Zoom. No problem. Thank you. Yeah. I want to I want to tell everybody uh, that we're speaking with Eric Yuan, who's the CEO of Zoom. And there is a tweet chat taking place right now. And you can ask Eric questions using the hashtag CXO talk. So, Eric, uh, another dimension of all of this is w what are the results that you see? Right. So you're doing all of these things. How do you know that it's working and how do you how do you measure it? What's your what are your points of evaluation? Yeah. So when you focus on the customer experience, make sure customer happy. I think they are going to help you see like our NPS score is 72, much better than any other competitors. You know, and also they always share, you know, the greatest stories with some others. Right. And they refer so many you know, prospect customer to us, right? And at the same time, when they use Zoom service, more like what you are using, always share feedback with us to help us to further improve our product. And because of that, that's why, you know, we can grow our revenue, grow, grow our business, you know, very well, right? In terms of uh, number of users, in terms of revenue, you know, it's, we are growing very well because of uh, those uh, great customers. So to what extent do you attribute the that culture versus the fact that your product has has seems to have the right features and it's stable as you said it just it just simply works can you even separate those two the culture from the product i think it you it, it cannot separate those two actually the, the product is kind of more like an outcome of your company culture right so you know occasionally you know if you don't have a great culture occasionally you might develop a, a, a good product however that's not sustainable Right, very soon, and you are not going to listen to customer. You try to add some features you think is right. The customer may not like it. If you have a good culture, really look at everything from a customer perspective. I think your your product, you know, will be sustainable. Meaning, you always can you know improve your product, improve your process, and improve everything you know to center around the customer experience. So that's why the culture is the number one important thing. Product is sort of the outcome. Of that. So the issue then is one of being able to deliver those those results in a consistent way. If you're consistent over time, then it becomes sustainable. And you're saying that it's the 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 underlying culture that makes these other things, or these other things are a reflection or an outgrowth of the right type of culture. Yes, absolutely. I gave one example, like right? it's a long, long time ago, right? So when I was still at WebEx, you know, early days of WebEx, you know, we were working very hard. You know, we built the first generation of a collaboration solution. But later on, if you if your team is becoming arrogant, not humble anymore, when customers share the feedback with you, you say, oh, 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 that's not important. You do not understand. That's why we should do, we should do this way. When you do that, you know, very soon. I think your product will fall apart, right? You cannot have a great product anymore. So that's why we always focus on culture and really look at everything from a customer perspective every day. We want to be very humble. To what extent is focusing on your employees important? But let me let me just make the comment that I that that I know the answer because recently Glassdoor selected you, selected Zoom as one of the best places to work. So obviously, your employees uh, feel something good is going on there. Yes. Yeah, so it, it boils down to you know we talk talk about a customer happiness. That's most important thing. But how to do it, right? So because when you build a business, right? You know you cannot say as a CEO, you cannot do everything, right? You you need to count on your employees, right? So every day, all those interactions between customers and and um, and our employees. How can we make sure our employee happy? If employees are not happy, I'm pretty sure the customer they can feel like that, right? 
and the customer will not be happy. So for me as a CEO, my number one priority is to make sure our employee happy. And then they can deliver happiness to our customers. I think that's, uh, you know, internally, this is uh, our number one priority. How does that, again, play out in a really practical way? And the reason I ask this, Eric, is because you talk to any CEO in Silicon Valley, every CEO says the same. Our number one priority is our employees. And you know what? 99% of the time, it's just words. So how do you make this play out in, in reality? That's a great question. I would say I would say 99.9% of CEOs, I would say they all share the same intention, right? To make sure the employee happy. But here at Zoom, and uh, you know, we are doing several things we think can really help us to make sure our employee happy. First of all, we have a clear, you know, very well defined culture that ever happens. And also our value is just one word, care. So meaning we care about the community, care about the customers, care about the company, care about ourselves, and care about our teammates. So the care is part of, is a core value of a company, right? We want to make sure every employee understands that. This is our you know, company. We've got to care about each other. So any questions from any of our employees, they are going to share with us. We build an open, transparent culture. You know, for once every two weeks, we have all hands meeting. You know, every employee, they can submit the questions anonymously, right? Anything, right? Feel free to let us know. And uh, because we, we, for us, you know, we are not looking to do just the, you know, maximize our company revenue, maximize our number of users. Every day, every manager, leaders, myself included, we always think about hey, how to make sure employee happy. Like, uh, give one example. We promote in you know, self-learning here. Employee told us, hey, I, I like to learn something, I'd like to buy a book. This is great. We reimburse the books. Any books you buy for yourself, for your family, we always reimburse. The reason why we care about you, right? There's so many things, you know, all those questions are coming from our employees. And then we think about how to make sure they are happy. What happens when people give you uh, negative feedback? You, you get negative feedback from employees about any, nobody likes to hear negative feedback. We all like to be told, hey, we're great. No, we really like a negative feedback because I learned from the former CEO of uh, Walmart, H.D. Scott, right? You know, and uh, the ability to give a constructive and honest feedback is a rare talent. The reason why those employees give feedback because they care about the company, right? This is our value. If they care about the company, no matter what kinds of feedback, good feedback, negative feedback, their intention is good. We trust our employees. Any negative feedback will help us to become a better company. That's why I, I like all those you know, negative feedbacks. You have a, a thousand or over a thousand employees. And you're growing really rapidly. And actually, let me ask you, how fast are you growing? You became, uh, I, again, one of these sort of horrible terms, a unicorn, uh, <laughs> meaning your valuation was over a billion dollars. So, so before we go on, tell us about your growth and, and things like that. Yeah. So yeah, two years ago, you know, we got a funding from uh, Sequoia. Back then, that's a billion dollar valuation, but we do not use that unicorn word, you know, often here at Zoom, we just uh, move forward, right? So, and uh, we more than doubled the employee headcount over the past, uh, you know, 12 months. And uh, we grew our user base revenue relatively well. And again, you know, we just, uh, we, we think that's more like outcome of uh, happy customers. As long as every day we make our product better, process better, and also make sure every interaction between our employees and the customers better, I think every else, you know, will be, you know, taken care of well. You more than doubled your employee headcount over the last year? I didn't know that. Wow. Yes, that's exactly what we, we did because... Uh, you know, we also expanded our business to, to international, to Japan, Australia, and Germany, France. You know, for sure, we need to hire more and more employees. And also think about, you know, next generation of collaboration solution, a lot of uh, cool features like artificial intelligence and more customer support. And that's why we have to, you know, uh, hire more and more the great employees. Wow, you're, you're a busy guy. I appreciate your taking the time to, uh, to be here in CXO Talk. Uh, so you're hiring all of these people. How do you find the right ones? Yes. Yeah, so normally we do not look at you. Hey, where you are? 
and where you graduated from or which company you worked for before. And we focus on the self-learning and self-motivation. Those two things are very important. You know, even if you, you see you never graduated from any college, as long as you really want to learn, very likely we are going to hire you. And also here at Zoom, you know, our managers, you know, myself included, we do not spend lots of time to motivate our employees. We really like those self-motivation employees because we are all adults, right? You, you've got to motivate yourself. That's why we focus on self-motivation and self-learning. We have some questions for Twitter from Twitter, and I'm going to a- answer the first one. And that we've had a lot of tweets, and so I think I've missed some questions. So if you've asked a question, please ask it once more, and I apologize. Again, it's the hashtag CXO talk. And we have a comment, a question from Jennifer Banzon. And Jennifer says, oh, this one, well, this will fall into the constructive criticism category, I'm afraid, Eric. Uh, And this is live and unrehearsed, everybody, right? So we, UCLA, are a customer and happy with Zoom. Webinar registration form has serious limitations and less than great customer experience. Any plans to enhance? Jennifer, thank you for sharing the feedback with us. And uh, to further improve our webinar, registration is indeed a part of our webinar roadmap. And uh, I will get back to you and about a uh, digital plan. I know for sure, you know, this is a part of our roadmap. We, we, we really understand that. Yeah, thank you. So again, I, I want to remind everybody, uh, now is a great time to ask questions of Eric Yuan. He's the CEO of Zoom. And we have him here as, as with captive attention. Uh, so ask questions using the hashtag CXO talk on Twitter, and we will get to your questions. Eric, so we were talking about selecting employees. You know, on, on the one hand, it sounds like life is great in paradise, but at the same time, anytime you're, you're growing rapidly, you're hiring so many people, you're building processes, what are the kinds of challenges that you face as you try to increase this and maintain this ideal and this reference point of uh, customer happiness? Yeah, so as I mentioned earlier, right? So if our employees are not happy, sooner or later, our customer will not be happy. If engineers are not happy, guess what? Their code will be very buggy, right? If the sales are not happy, I do not think they can share the great story about a company, about a product. So ultimately, the culture is still a number one important thing. How to maintain the happiness culture, right? How, when you hire the employees, how can you quickly, you know, let the employee know, right? Like, you know, knowledge transfer, you know, evolve our company, the process, and really care about the employees. Whenever the, the employees have a questions and problems, how you can care about them, quickly resolve those issues, it's not something very easy. That's why, you know, even if r- our intention is great, really focus on, you know, employee happiness, still we have uh, so many problems every day. But we understand that this is a part of uh, the journey to grow your business. As long as we really focus on that, as long as we trust our employees, as long as we're humble, we're paranoid, I think we'll be okay. So, and uh, that's the uh, nature of growing any business. Is there a tension between the investment that you need to make in keeping employees happy and, uh, and, and other aspects, you know, having processes and designing software with a good user interface? All of these things can be done less well or better. Is there a tension between the, the additional capital requirements and the time that things take to get it done right versus this goal? In other words, to ask it more simply, why don't you just take some shortcuts? Nobody's going to notice, right? I mean, no one will know. You'll make more money. Why don't you just do that? I think you cannot focus on short-term in order come. You got to do, look at it in the long run, right? So make sure everything you're doing is sustainable. Otherwise, quite often, the short-term, again, might cause huge problems for the future, right? Even you added a feature, you see, you, you want to increase the price because you when you have that feature, nobody else can offer that. That's why you want to increase the price. I think that's absolutely wrong, right? Don't do that, right? And we want to make sure everything we're doing here, the product side or people investment, 
or process, make sure everything's sustainable. That's really important. So sustainability then over the longer term is a key part of this. Absolutely, because you know, to build a, a, a successful company is a long journey. I right? don't think about overnight success. Don't think about five years, 20 to 10 years. Always think about hey, in the long run, in ten, if you look back, you know, 10 years from now, is it still the right thing to do? Is it still the right feature? Is this still the right investment? And we always you know, need to look at it from that perspective. So you have ingrained in the decision-making processes uh, looking at the longer-term perspective as well as the shorter-term results. Absolutely. Whenever there's a conflict, we always focus on the long-term. You're in this amazing position of having this very rapidly growing company. Uh, you have the revenue, you have great funding. What can a company do, a CEO do, that doesn't have the luxury of this kind of cushion? How can they, and they have to cut corners because they just simply don't have the money to, to invest. What can a, a CEO or a company in that position do to maintain this kind of approach of customer happiness? I want to say, go to, you know, take a step back. Don't always think about growing your business. Don't always think about double your revenue, triple your user base, double your headcount. You know, always take a step back and look at who will be your first user. Who will be your first paid customer? Make sure, spend all the time, make sure your first user, first paid customer happy. Just start from there. And then you, you might get a second one. And then focus on the second one. And focus on the third one. Don't always think about growing your business. Think about how to make sure your existing users are happy. If you do that, you know, everything else will follow. So meaning you have more and more customers, they are going to call you. You even do not need to spend money on marketing from to get more customers. And they are going to come to you. And then you can you know, grow your user base. And then you will you know, kind of uh, you know, get more you know, funding from uh, VCs, right? So focus on the most important thing, your existing customers and your existing employees. Don't every day think about you know, growing and growing. So I would say our philosophy is don't grow too fast. Always focus on the existing customer, focus on our employee happiness. You sound like a guy who's running a services business rather than a guy who's running a product company. And I understand software as a service is a service, but, but really, you sound like a professional services consultant person. We are a service company. I think in the future, every company, every software company is a service company. And because everything is delivered from a cloud, right? And software as a service, essentially, you build a, a software, you do not sell the software anymore. You sell the service. You know, service is not only software, but also, uh, you know, the, the billing, right? The cancellation, the product experience, right? How to uh, migrate, you know, from uh, one cloud to another cloud, right? So ultimately, you're right. That's a service-oriented economy. And the, it sounds, again, like... Uh like your your entire mindset is beginning with the service and i mean i'm simplifying it but that's sounds like that's your life yes if you think about every day how to serve your customer well right either they call you or you added a feature or you make it a process easier if you do not serve your your subscribers well this is a software as a service world they are going to cancel your service you see like a macro ticket your use case, for example, if Zoom does not work next month, you are going to cancel. You are going to find something else, right? It's very easy. Let's change topic slightly um, and talk about the, the future uh, collaboration and where is all of this going? I don't mean in five or 10 years, but over the next two, three, maybe four years. Because you're, you're, you're helping shape this market and you're in a position to see what's going on and what your most advanced customers are doing. So, so where is this going over the next, uh, next several years? I think, uh, first of all, I would say a video is going to become a mainstream service. So meaning, you know, next several years, no matter where you go, no matter where, what kind of device you are using, just one click, you can have a video communication, video collaboration like this experience. But a download, we truly believe the online video collaboration, video communication experience will deliver probably a much better 
experience than face to face meeting. You know, like uh, you know, early uh, this year, and then we announced uh, the meeting transcription feature. So meaning after the meeting is over, we can generate text based transcription. In the physical meeting, I do not think we can have that, right? I think more and more, I think all those cool features like, uh, you know, uh, AR or maybe the AI technology will be applied into the video collaboration, you know, industry, truly change the experience of online video collaboration. Other kinds of things that you see coming down the road that, that will make the, me, the online meeting experience better and, and improved relative to in-person? Yeah, quite a few things. Like I see, Michael, I'm talking with you. Unfortunately, we are not in the same physical conference room. I really cannot shake hands with you, right? But in the future, I think a, a cool feature will be added into this. If I shake hands, you can feel like that. And I give you a hug, you also can feel like that, right? I think ultimately in the next five to 10 years, I think those kind of cool features will be added into video collaboration. And essentially you can sit anywhere you feel like in the same conference room and experience even better. Where will AI, artificial intelligence and machine learning come into play? And I know unlike many, many, many other software companies, you don't call yourself an AI company and thank you for that. Uh, but I know that AI, as you mentioned earlier, is something that you're working on. And so what's the relevance of machine learning and AI to video collaboration? Yeah, AI is a technology. I, you're so right. We are not going to see, talk about AI that much. However, AI as a technology will help us improve our product experience. You know, customers, they may not see that. I give an example. See, you know, like I take a webinar, for example, right? So if the host, the webinar host or moderator, right? When you switch a topic, if we, maybe you, you talk too fast, right? We can leverage AI technology and based on the attendee's face detection, we would say, hey, please slow down. So Michael, when you ask a question, and Erica as an audience do not understand that because my face like this, you know, based on AI technology, we will send it a real time reminder. Either slow down or, or it give you some uh, a suggestion, right? And also to leverage AI, we can make the AI based, you know, meeting transcription you know, more and more, you know, accurate. Right today, to ninety percent, ninety one percent, how to do you know improve that to ninety five percent? All those AI technology behind the scene will help us improve the product experience. How about in terms of uh, improving video quality, audio quality? Because you're you're limited by the internet and by compression. So, is there a role for AI um, to improve those areas as well? Very right. Actually, we have a big team. And working on the, the the audio quality improvement, like noise reduction, you know, echo cancellation. You know, we use the AI framework, right, to analyze where the noise is coming from, you know, how the the echo you know is generated, and then to leverage that to improve our audio quality. We are we are already doing that for a while, actually. You're uh, you're using a AI or machine learning to improve audio quality already? Yes, yes, we are doing that for for already several years. Yeah. And so, so you're saying that in this instance, you're using these techniques to evaluate the type of noise and then therefore how to compensate. Yes, and also based on the, 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 the every meeting experience you know, based on the AI framework, and we keep improving that. We have, a, we have an algorithm, right? You know, to, to improve the, the, the like echo and the noise, yeah. Your audio and video quality tends to be really, really good. So now I'm asking these questions because I have a personal interest in this topic because I do this video streaming thing all the time. And so I happen to be really interested in, in, the, in these, these, these issues. So I'll just, and I figure, hey, I'm like the audience, right? It's a good, good opportunity for me, for me to ask. Uh, so, so I know you invest a lot of time in the, the audio and the video quality. How, what do you do? Uh, and how do you ensure that your quality is better than competitors and better than what's come before? So again, every day, you know, we leverage our backend monitoring data, right? So analyze every meeting, every you know uh, data, so to see you know how many meetings you know have a great experience, how many meetings might have a problem. Right? Based on that, we're trying to understand why this meeting or that meeting have a problem. Maybe oh. As one meeting, the Wi-Fi is not reliable. The data loss rate more than the 55 percent. 
really cannot recover from that, right? The audio quality, video quality, not a good. And then, you know, we kind of uh, let our team you know, work on how can we further improve our audio or video algorithm, right? To support the, the good video quality, see like you have data loss rate more than 50, 55%. Or maybe, you know, you have a long haul connection, right? Between here and see maybe attendance in Africa, right? So how to improve that, right? So every day our engineer team are working very hard to really address the real time problems. One of the issues that comes up for me because I interview so many people using um, relatively cheap webcams is the lack of quality that the webcam, that the hardware is able to generate. I mean, just, just in terms of exposure compared to say cameras with a larger sensor. Is there anything that, that you can do to take that low quality image and somehow improve it, even though the, the source quality may not be that great? Yeah, so I'm using a webcam now, right? It's about, you know, 50 bucks, you know, webcam. I think uh, after, we, after we, you know, capture the, the video data from the camera, we, we also have a software layer, right? Try to improve the quality, right? And also that's why we built an advanced algorithm, right? To improve that quality. You know, we're not only just count on the video capture data from uh, the webcam, but also have our own layer to improve the video quality. So, I mean, the ideal thing would be for you to somehow work some type of magic on the data coming out of that webcam to produce a better result than one would expect from a sensor of that size, basically. Yes, yeah, so like uh, encoding efficiency, you know, like uh, uh, the color, you know, change and also, you know, adjust your, your, your lightning, all those kind of things, right? So we also have those, uh, you know, layers, you know, to improve the video quality. We have another question from Twitter. This is, uh, okay, so now we step back from, from geek questions about video quality and compression. By the way, I could go very deep. I would love to go deep, deep, deep on this topic, but, uh, but we have a question from Twitter and regarding uh, the workplace and future of work collaboration, Gus Beckdash is asking how can AI help with reducing the information overload? I think uh, that's a great question. You know, like uh, there's so many information available every day, right? There's so many new information is going to be generated every day. You know, I think, uh, you know, I think the, the systems or, or software or, or the service, they, they should understand, you know, your preference, right? Meaning what kind of a topic you like. They try to you know, push the data to you. Rather, every day you need to, look around, right, to, to find the, the information, find the tools, right? I think the system will become, you know, much better if uh, we further level AI technology. Like, hey, see, like, Michael, we, based on your, you know, the, the, you know, like, every day, which website you go, which product you are using, we know how you really like video, right? So whenever we have a video enhancement, we should automatically send the enhancement, you know, information to you. Right, rather than you try to look around, oh, where the video enhancement, right? This AI we really can understand, you know, every user and then send the right information to you. We only have about five minutes left. I have a lot of questions I want to ask you, but uh, how do you balance the richness of developing a rich set of features with the need to keep the product as simple as possible? Well, that's a wonderful question. That's every day, actually. You know, so I can tell you every day, we never ever had a new engineers. We always were making some mistakes. You know, quite often, say you have a 10 users, right? You know, one user is really upset about one feature. They send a feedback to you. On the one hand, we got to listen to them. On the other hand, if you just added a feature to make sure this user is happy, guess what? Very likely, you make the other nine users not happy. Right? How to balance that? Right? So quite often we we always look at you know if only uh, two or three years they need that feature, we are not going to change the experience for everybody. You know we are going to add the uh, advanced uh, you know features, right? You know to easily let you find that you can turn on that feature by yourself. You're so right. Otherwise, you know down the road you will add more and more features. The product will become so complex. Also, we needed to really understand why customers need this feature. Quite often, you know, we need to understand the pain point. 
you know, very likely most of users, they will tell you how to fix that. They already give you the solution, but do not all blindly follow what they told you. Really take a step back and understand, hey, why you have this problem, right? And then try to figure out the root cause and then work together with the customer to build up the new features to satisfy the customer needs. Okay, but this flies in the face of customer happiness because I'm a customer, I want you to change something and I want you to change it now. And I'm unhappy because you're saying no because other customers don't need it. And sometimes yes, because the, you know, the question, you know, the, the feature request will benefit everybody, why not? If only benefit you or maybe some other users, we want to be very careful because we should look at it from every user perspective. But otherwise, very easy to add more features. But guess what? Later on, that's the right reason like the web as product I built it before. It's so hard to use. There's so many things. Nobody is going to use that anymore. I was going to make a comment. You know, I pay $19 a month or whatever Zoom cost. And I don't care about the long term of Zoom. I want my feature built and I want it now. So please tell me the feature and we'll figure out a way to serve <laughs> you well. But that feature may not be exposed to all other users, but we still can add this feature to your profile. But then you're into developing custom software, which you, which, you know, so again, no, but seriously, how do you balance? How do you make these, these balancing decisions? Again, this is a service, not only software, because we deliver everything to the, from the cloud. Not like a traditional software, everybody need, should install the same word. You know, our backend side, our cloud, there's so many different configurations, right? So for your profile, we enable this feature, we enable an advanced echo cancellation. For others, you know, it's just based on your profile, we can automatically enable or dispose some advanced features like a security, uh, all those cool things. We, Essentially, we already have all those features, but different based on different account setting, based on different user profile, we deliver different feature setting. That's a part of the, I would say, the the the, the beauty of a cloud, you know, service. And and I will say that in my uh, two years of using Zoom, um, your your team, you guys have been very very responsive. I mean, so I know I know with you that. You really mean it, then, and, and that's what you do. We have literally about a minute left, and so in that final minute, can you kind of summarize everything you know? What's what's most important? Just in a minute, our final minute. Tell us the secret. Actually, I have so many things that I don't know. I really want to learn. Right, so every day when I come to the office, I really want to understand where we have a problem. That's why I, I like reading all those books. Really want to talk with the customers, get their feedback. It's not about what kind of thing I know. It's really about what kind of thing you want to learn, and then can quickly learn from from either customer feedback or from others' success or, or, or stories and apply that to your business. This is a self learning. That's really important. And as we finish up, what advice, what final advice do you have for other people trying to build a company? You've, you've mentioned some things earlier, but people trying to build a company, looking at Zoom as a role model, what advice do you have for those folks? It's very simple. If you have a dream, just do it. Don't hesitate. Okay. Well, we are out of time. I, I would like to thank Eric Yuan who is the founder and the CEO of Zoom for joining us today. Eric, thank you so much for taking time and being with us today. Thank you. Appreciate it. Everybody, we have more great shows coming up. Go to cxotalk.com. And right now, right, right, right this second, would you please, please subscribe on YouTube? Because that really does help us out a lot. Thanks, everybody. I hope you have a great week. And uh, we'll see you next time. Bye-bye.